So the so-called euro crisis, which, as I will explain in a minute, is not really a euro crisis, is in its fourth year. We're preparing for banking union, and as we're preparing for it, we're worrying about what's going to come out with asset quality review and stresses of banks. Banking systems have not yet recovered. Government finances have not yet recovered. There's popular unrest in the periphery countries, the countries that have been hit by austerity. And we also have popular unrest in the countries that have not been hit by austerity. Everybody's wondering when will we be having the next flare up, the next haircut. And the next bailout. So, how do we get into this mess? The, in principle, everything had been arranged and designed so that no big problem could arise. The no bailout clause of the Maastricht Treaty suggested that each country in terms of fiscal policy has to fend for its own. The Stability and Growth Pact provided some monitoring points. So, there should not have been any problem with the governance of fiscal policy. In particular, since the treaty led the ECB to abstention from government finance. As for financial systems, I mean, there have been warning voices about uh, banking and banking regulation in monetary union, uh, including uh, my own at some point. They had it all set up very cleanly. If banks are insolvent, it's the national taxpayer who has to provide for recapitalization or resolution. If banks have liquidity problems, for the National Central Bank to deal with that. If the entire financial system has liquidity problems, it's for the ECB to intervene through market transactions, incidentally open market operations, so as not to provide subsidies to banks. How did this work out? Well, two and a half years ago, or three and a half years ago, we had a deviation from the no bailout clause in the case of Greece. According to the politicians involved, the states, men and women involved, Greece had a liquidity problem, no market access, and by 2013 there would be market access. A few months later, Sarkozy and Merkel and their wisdom decided that we should be having private sector involvement, i.e. creditors of sovereigns should be made liable if the sovereigns didn't pay. Only not now, only from 2013 onward. No discussion of what that meant for government bonds outstanding with the maturity of 2020, or for government bonds with the maturity of 2012 that needed to be refinanced. So that created a bit of turmoil, and one of the finance ministers decided that private sector involvement would only come in cases of insolvency, not in cases of inequality. Yet another few months later, Private sector involvement now, but only 20%. Yet another few months later, now, and it'll be over 50%. I think in the end, it varies depending on how you count between 50 and 70%. Right now, we're waiting when we're going to see the next haircut. Of course, we've been told by the German finance minister that there would never be another haircut. sequence of events is not exactly evidence of consistent strategic planning. 
One might even suggest that at least some of the people involved didn't really know what they were doing or didn't know what was needed to have sustainable strategies. So, why were the principles broken? And why was there all this flip-flopping between different ways to approach this? Basically, the crisis was altogether more than the system could handle. Some confusion was created by the notion that this was a currency crisis with journalists loved to uh, explain in the early months of 2010, pointing to the fact that the euro was devaluing against the dollar, which was little more than a, an overdue correction of an overvaluation. The real problem is that we have a mixture of crises. We have a traditional sovereign debt crisis in Greece, Portugal, and there it's not quite so clear in Italy. We have a traditional real estate and banking crisis in Ireland and Spain. And then we have a hidden banking crisis in Germany and France where banks have been weak even before 2008 and the mess of 2008 had never really been cleaned up. And in order to understand why we have to move forward, we have to appreciate that we have three sets of intermingled banking crises, banking and sovereign crises, uh, that have uh, been <coughs> so difficult to handle. Sovereign crises, well, sovereigns sometimes don't make end meet, and then they go into debt, and one way to do this, do so, is to ask or to coerce banks into funding them. And once there are haircuts, that causes insolvencies of banks. In Argentina, more than 10 years ago, just as in Greece, two years ago, part of the uh, Greek package of early 2012 involved the needed recapitalization of Greek banks that have become insolvent from the haircut of Greek debt. Weimar Germany 
borrowed more from the U.S. throughout the 20s than it paid in reparations. Throughout the 1920s, Mark McCurney was a net receiver of funds. Never mind. The legend has it that it was a net pay. And I think that that point has an important parallel to the great experience of the past four years. It's important to see these things because they matter for the dynamics of public discourse in the different countries. Another example, the Civil Service Pay Reform of 1928 provided uh, increases of civil service pay from 20, ranging between 25 and 50 percent at a time of highly deficitary public budgets. I think there are uh, some countries uh, that have also taken that as a model. So, uh, in anything I say, which is which might be seen as being critical of any one country, uh, it should be understood that I'm fully aware that this is not a difference between countries as such, but it has to do with contingencies of a given situation, of a given society, and that we need to understand the mechanisms to some extent in order to appreciate where are we going. So what is going on? A lack of market integration, a lack of market discipline, a lack of fiscal discipline, and where banks are concerned, a lack of effective supervision. Lack of integration, and I think this is one of the most serious issues at the foundations of the monetary union. We have a monetary union, but we have separated goods markets. I remember 10 years ago at a conference of the German Economic Association, they asked the question, how do you do monetary policy when you have different inflation rates in different countries? And the monetarist economist told me there is no such thing as different inflation rates in a given monetary system. There can only be one inflation rate and different relative prices. Changes in relative prices. To some extent, that's a question about semantics. But I think that the notion of different inflation rates is actually a useful way, the semantics of talking about different inflation rates is actually a useful way to understand what happened 10 years ago. Because 10 years ago, we had inflation rates in Ireland and Spain on the order of 5%, and in Germany on the order of uh, less than 1%, and the ECB was trying to make monetary policy for some average of them. Why does this matter? Well, if nominal interest rates are the same, that means that real interest rates differ. And real interest rates at the time were low in Ireland and Spain, and somewhat higher in Germany. Which meant that investment demand, say building projects, were much more active in Ireland and Spain and in Germany than in Germany. And that contributed to capital flows, savings being invested from Germany in countries like Ireland and Spain. To some extent, that was precisely uh, the kind of mechanism that one would have liked because with better integration, one thought, one should have thought that capital should flow or investment should flow to countries where capital was scarcer. To some extent, well, it was just feeding a bubble. And uh, we've seen the implications of that uh, in the crisis that followed afterwards. So the conceptual problem of how to deal with uh, a constellation where goods markets are, well, and of course uh, labor markets as well are not really integrated 
and the other for real greater pictures differ. Uh, that's one of the deep economic challenges of modern Sharif. Now you might say, why were nominal rates of interest the same? Should nominal rates of interest reflect notions of risk? Would one have expected that nominal rates of interest in Ireland and Spain were higher than in Germany? Well, they were. Why not? That's actually one of the big puzzles. In the early years of the monetary union, risk premium for different sovereigns were non existent. Was this the case because there was no consciousness of such risk? Or was this the case because financial institutions were gambling the system and betting that they would be bailed out anyway? I've seen arguments of the sort that if the regulation treats sovereign debt as riskless, then that means that there's a commitment on the side of the authorities, whichever, to bail out banks when the sovereigns get in control. At the same time, the lack of exchange rate discipline had implications on economic policies and contributed to the lack of discipline in economic policy and fiscal policy. Particularly in the small and fragmented types of economies that we have in Europe, exchange rate movements in the past have been used as indicators of how the world saw the performance of the economy, the performance of the government, and that indicator is gone. Also, exchange rate risk as a break on foreign borrowing or lending to this country has disappeared. And the supervisors slept. More precisely, those that didn't sleep, like the Bank of Spain, which in the mid-2000s actually wanted to do something to uh, slow down the real estate bubble, came under the influence of their governments, which didn't exactly cherish the notion of stopping this wonderful business in real estate development in the various uh, cities and provinces. Lack of fiscal discipline. I started out by mentioning the no bailout clause and the stability of the growth pact. There's always an illusion about enforcement. The paradigmatic example of that is the Asian general of the Allies under the Dawes Plan, who was unable to prevent the 1928 pay increase, even though he was supposed to be contributing to imposing fiscal discipline. One problem that we're dealing with is that we have different states with different societies and different universes of discourse that establish political legitimacy. And these different states have different fiscal traditions. Attitudes towards financial repression, attitudes towards central bank funding of governments differ across countries. If you look at the European Union before 1990, you see a strong pattern of funding of governments by banking regulation, forcing banks to lend to the government at subsidized rates, at below market rates, and funding the government by the central bank's printing press. That's, that used to be a way of compensating for
for deficiencies in income taxation. Differences in such attitudes towards such regimes are not something which one destroys just by signing a treaty. At an even deeper level, there are differences in tradition as to what is the role of the state. In France, industrial policy, public services are an important part of what the state is about. Industrial policy can be very expensive. In France, I pay very dearly for butcher-based industrial policy. Can we imagine a fiscal commissar from Brussels imposing on a country to abandon its political decision <laughs> of how to run the government. I have serious doubts about that, therefore I also have serious doubts about the viability and the sustainability of the fiscal pact that's been concluded a year ago. <clears throat> Banking regulation. Following the crisis, we have not had much of a reform in banking regulation. Our book is basically a recommendation and discussion of the proposal to require banks to fund much more with equity because equity is liable and equity can absorb losses. If you are a government and you think of the bank as a source of funds, Think of French bank Dexia, which was involved in funding uh, local and regional governments. You see, they have sold so much by way of equity. How much can they provide to the government? If the equity requirement is 20%, only five times that amount can be provided to government funding. If it's 2%, 50 times that. In Dexia, the equity actually was between 1 and 2 percent. Banks are where the money is, is what a bank robber is supposed to have said when a journalist asked him, why do you rob banks? It's what many politicians would say when you ask them, why do you regulate banks? And this is why continental European countries have been very averse to becoming serious about banking regulation after the crisis. Hedge funds, yes. Financial transactions tax, yes. Short sales, yes. Except none of these had anything serious to do with the crisis. Either the version of 2007-2008 or the euro crisis. Much of the financial crisis had to do with the lack of equity. But if you impose equity requirements, banks might tell you, we don't want to fund you anymore. So this is why in banking regulation we have the notion that banks don't actually need equity to fund governments. This is how Dexia could get away with 1 to 2% of its balance sheet in equity because they funded so much that had a zero risk weight, as it's called. Financial repression has seen a resurgence since 2008. And that's part of the problem that we currently have. Prior to 1990, for the periphery country, countries, shares of old sovereigns and bank balance sheets were on the order of 30 to 35 to 45 percent. This went down to the mid single digit numbers by 2007, and now it's back up between 10 and 20 percent. That's because these sovereigns found it difficult to get market funding, and they lean on their banks. We also see a pronounced fragmentation.
financial systems cross border inside the euro area are no longer integrated the way they were before 2008. Much of this has to do with <coughs> political pressure. By the way, in Germany, just as well as in Spain or Greece. Uh, the German regulator, the German supervisor, has told its banks, cut back on your foreign exposures. Real estate funding. Real estate is very important for our interests. Serious concerns about voters. Also, builders tend to be very much connected with local elites in the financial sector and in political systems. This was a mechanism that was important in Spain. We can see the same in most other countries. Finally, we all love our national champions. Examples I already talked about next year. HSH Note Bank. They used to be proud of being the biggest financiers of ships in the world. Their owner is the city of Hamburg in the Nantenkrise of Stein. The city of Hamburg loves having Hamburg be the center of shipping finance. Never mind that they are probably insolvent from losses, hidden losses on shipping loans right now. Various mergers. Promoted by governments, promoted by the media, the media play an active role in this, in, in uh, favor of national champions. So the notion that these are our banks, and uh, we love the way they use their money to listen to us, that's key to all this. So French and German banks in 2010 poorly capitalized a lot of excess capacity and a lot of exposures. Dexia didn't have much Greek debt, and Hugo Real Estate didn't have much Greek debt. But what they had was sufficient to make them insolvent, given how little equity they had. Some of the other banks, well, loved to be given time in order to sell the stuff to secure the banks, which then needed to be bailed out uh, earlier this year. So where are we then? We still have a situation where we must say that debt levels altogether are very high. The banks are weak. And there is empirical research by Mila Acharya and by you and co-authors showing that the notion of banks lending to firms is fine when we're talking about banks that are well capitalized. When banks borrow from the ECB and lend to the sovereigns or invest in securities markets. We don't have viable institutions. The mix of politics, banking, and banking supervision is still there. And there is a temptation, it's only a liquidity problem. Let's sweep things under the rug. And if we wait for long enough, they'll resolve themselves. This is what the Japanese did in the early 90s. And they've suffered for 20 years from that. Why is there no progress? Very little workable discourse at both the national and the supranational level. At the supranational level, it isn't just the problem of conflicts between the different parties involved, but it's also that we're moving more and more into a territory where legitimacy <coughs> for what's being done is missing. Everybody's afraid of using, of, of treating the treaty. And this is why a banking union has been introduced, the single supervisory mechanism has been introduced under the auspices of the 
existing treaty, Article 127.6, the ECB can be assigned special, specific tasks in connection with supervision. The Arctic has a heading on her policy. Now it's supposed to be becoming uh, responsible for all the vacation. That's a legal trick, which fuels popular discontent with what these elites are doing. ECB. Everybody loves the ECB because the ECB will bail the system out. We banks, as I was saying before, borrow from the ECB. And the politicians have learned that in spite of mass they can get access to the printing press. If they leave their banks weak, the bank gets into difficulties and the ECB supports them. The very strength, the fact that it's the only institution which is able to act in a decisive manner becomes a weakness. Because being in charge of price stability and monetary stability, well, what's the ECB to do? Should it let the banking systems go under? Of course, the German view of all this is that the ECB is independent, but it must not do anything different from the Bundeskanzler, especially not anything which uh, German economists dislike. And there are lots of legalisms relating to the prohibition of direct lending to governments in the treaty. Let me say, on this point, I think the legal discussion is completely besides the point and I don't think that the legalism should be taken seriously, except that it might be the case that the German Constitutional Courts two months from now will pronounce that whether or not what the ECB is doing is legal under the treaty, if the treaty allows it, that the treaty is incompatible with the German Constitution and needs to be renegotiated. Price stability is an objective viability of the monetary and financial system. The underlying problem is really that however a central bank introduces money into the economy, it produces windfalls to some. And there is always distributive effects with the printing of money. If it lends to banks, the banks profit. One reason why things are relatively quiet right now is if you can borrow at close to zero percent then as a banker, you should be able to make a profit, otherwise you should get out of banking. If it buys securities, the issuers of securities make money. This is one reason why as a student I learned that uh, a central bank should not begin to buy private shares, because it should discriminate between issues. And that this was why the central bank should buy government bonds. Think about the LTROs, long-term refinancing operations. Are they sold and saving and sold banks? There is no way to distinguish these things. Why are the LTROs necessary? After the prospect of the Greek haircut became serious, there was a question as to whether some European banks might be insolvent. That is actually did become so. Funding broke away. Stock market went into a tailspin. Banks sold stocks, sold assets in order to get cash. And we had a prosecutor dynamic which was less serious than in September 2008, but still looked quite dangerous. Should the ECB have stood by passively? Well, 
Well, this set we're going to provide three-year funding on the order of one trillion euros and support the system. Let's go back to the original assignment. Solvency issues are for the sovereigns. To the extent that banks have been bailed out before, or banks have been kept alive before, <coughs> close to insolvent. I mentioned the example of HSH Nova. I could have mentioned many others. LTRO has <coughs> provided ECB funds to recapitalize. Should they not have done that? I submit that we are better off for not having had the beginning of that crisis. In my view, the LTRO is much more important. And there is absolutely no doubt about the legality of what the ECB was doing. It's much more important in orders of magnitude than the ECB intervention in sovereign debt, both the securities markets program and the uh, proposed outright monetary transactions. A key issue for the future is going to be are we going to continue like this? Or can we change the governance of the system? In the past, Build-up of risks was unchecked. Dangerous business practices were allowed. The perfect supervisor was championed in this. But now, forbearance, extend, and protect of banks towards their own customers. That's not right down the numbers, or else we might have a solvency problem. Our assets might become smaller than our liabilities. For real estate loans in various countries, just as for shipping loans of German banks. Uh, that's being tolerated by the supervisors. Because if you don't tolerate it, you have to decide if you want to close the bank, if you want to bail it out, if you want to recapitalize them, who's going to fund the recapitalization. We also have insufficient downsizing of the industry. One reason why we've gone into these strong exposures is that we have significant excess capacity in banking in Europe. Bank capacity relative to GDP is about three to four times what it is in the US and three to four times what it was 20 years ago. Because each country that's proud of itself wants to have a national champion, some bank, mega bank that can rival those global giants. And some countries have used banking systems as a way to, uh, well, to have a better policy.
the ECB will apply all EU law. In the case of directives, remember, directives are not directly applicable and it's difficult to apply the non-applicable law. It's going to apply <coughs> the national legislation that implements the directive. So the ECB will be applying 16 different, 16 plus different legal norms in the different member states, subject to judicial review in the different member states, with different traditions of attitudes towards something like exercise of judgment by an administrative authority. I'm not saying why about the prospects. Asset quality review. Suppose the ECB looks at low books of various books and finds. One might wonder about how good these loans really are. If it's one bank or two banks, fine. But if it's an entire banking system, how do you handle it? You risk a systemic crisis, especially if this occurs in the context where the sovereign is weak and has difficulties in putting up the funds to uh, recapitalize. Without a resolution system, just a single supervisory mechanism is not going to be enough. Of resolution. Do the governments want to give up the power to determine which banks are there and which are not? I was saying before, banking is political. And that's what the conflict is really about. There is a deeper problem here. You need funding when you need access. You can say, okay, for most operations we can talk about deposit insurance funds or restructuring funds and get the money from there. But those funds take time to build up and in a system crisis they, they are not enough. In a system crisis you need a fiscal backstop. Or you need to bail in the bank's creditors. Of course, bailing in creditors has become very unpopular since Lehman Brothers. And we didn't have really wanted to do that. Fiscal backstop. The ESM is insufficient. And we don't have a tax base, federal EU tax base, at the EU level. Can we have funding for resolution without something like a central government or a central authority. Moving in this direction is important, but it does raise the question of what's going to happen to the, uh, to the uh, funding and what sources for backstops are we going to have. Of course, the German attitude to this is wonderfully consistent uh, the ECB must check that the real estate valuations in the book of the Kahats are completely all right, but they should dare really look at the ship valuations in HSH normal or Council. I suspect that's not just a German attitude, but with you, you accounting for differences between different uh, different countries, universal. So, we really do need forward on this. But, and I think here is a major conflict, a major issue for the Euro, the Euro area, if not the European Union as well. The power of our banks has traditionally on the European continent been regarded as part of what makes up sovereignty. And the question is, 
to what extent the member states are ready to give that. <coughs> are they ready to accept it? that banks are taken out of their own domain. More than 10 years ago, the Swiss municipality of Wakala went into insolvency. The banks have thought this cannot happen because they will receive assistance from the canton of the Swiss Confederacy. The canton of the Swiss Confederacy said, this is none of our business. I think that we need to move ahead towards a real mechanism. 